Hello, I'm Sin from Art Science Museum. Thank you for joining us at Conversations Feeding the Future, part of Art Science at Home, our online series of programs. This program of talks examines the human capacity to imagine new futures in a world where uncertainty and anxiety are prevalent. We will be engaging with thought leaders on topical issues to reflect on where we are and where we might be heading in these extraordinary times. The scale and scope of the current pandemic is unprecedented. How do we go about making sense of its longer term impacts? It is our pleasure to introduce Scott Smith, founder and managing partner of Changest, who is the second guest speaker in Conversations Feeling the Future. Scott is known for his work in tracking trends that combines grounded research with narrative design to explore the unanticipated. He's also author of the upcoming book, How to Future, Leading and Sense Making in an Age of Hyperchange. In his talk, Scott will be sharing practical tools for mapping out possible futures in a crisis to unpack orders of impact of significant change. Hi, I'm Scott Smith. I'm managing partner of Changest. We're a futures strategy and innovation group based in The Hague here in the Netherlands. And I want to talk to you a little bit about making maps to make sense of what's going on around us. Like most of you, we've been stuck inside for the past six or eight weeks, not really able to go out a lot because of the coronavirus pandemic. But we do have a little bit of freedom to, to get out and about. So yesterday, I took a short trip down to the center of the city to find out how things were and see what was going on. And two of the places that we find in the center of the city are uh, really interesting in this in this kind of topic. One is the National Archive. So think about that as representing the past. There are three and a half million documents inside the National Archive, and 15 kilometers of shelves containing information, photographs, books, research, other items that, that cover the history of the Dutch nation from 1600 to 1975. That's a tremendous amount of information, but it's not all just kind of thrown into the archive. There's a, a, a scheme or a structure that's been put in place by researchers and archivists to help anyone who goes into the archive to understand how it structures the past. So they've got a kind of map, they have a way of, of finding things in the past that are of interest to them, finding information that they need so that they can reconstruct history and understand what's happened. Now, if you walk about 100 meters to the right of the National Archive, you come to Den Haag Central Station. And in Central Station, there are 12 tracks, probably about two dozen trains that enter and exit on a normal day, taking people across the entire country of the Netherlands and to, to a few stations outside the country. Um, that's a lot of trains coming and going to national and, and regional destinations in the course of an hour. There's also trams and buses that take you to different local destinations. And in the middle of the station is a big signboard. Basically, it's a schedule. And that schedule is a map of the near future. It's a map that gives people a sense of when they come into the station or are looking to reach a destination, where they need to go, uh, where the train or bus or tram is departing from, when it's departing and how long it's gonna to take to get there. So they don't just walk into a, a random uh, tangle of transportation hubs and uh, try to guess at where they're going to go. They use that schedule as a way of kind of understanding the structure of the near future and giving them some expectation about what's going to happen. Now, sometimes, as in the last few weeks, uh, that structure and that schedule begins to break down. We've seen, for example, flights getting canceled, trains getting canceled, only limited departures and arrivals on certain tracks. And so that map of the future that most people have come to understand about how they come and go and reach different destinations has begun to break down. And that leaves people pretty confused and unclear and frankly somewhat anxious about how they're going to get outside of the city, how they're gonna reach other places uh, nearby and how they go about doing their business or um, seeing family or making medical visits or whatever they need to do. And this happens to us occasionally in the larger world as well. Right now with a thing, something like the, the coronavirus pandemic, um, our uh, knowledge is very confusing. We have a lot of information being thrown at us. We have a lot of statistics, um, stories, word of mouth, news stories, TV programs, um, people's comments on the internet and social media. 
And when we are suddenly confronted with a lot of disorganized information like that, um, we either run from it, we let it pile up as a kind of future debt of information that we're not sorting through or understanding, or we reach for familiar or comfortable frames or, or stories that we can plug that information into. Some of those are things like, um, you know, books or stories about the future. Maybe we've seen a movie about a pandemic, um, or we've heard some futurists talking about uh, what's going to happen in five, 10 or 20 years. We might reach for uh, a favorite science fiction author, uh, and whether it's a utopia or a dystopia and try to fit this information into that framework. But of course, things aren't like those works of fiction. And even if it's a professional consultant producing scenarios, sometimes things don't fit there as well. Um, we reach for big archetypes of futures where there's going to be a massive transformation or a rapid decline. And realistically, none of those models actually fit reality. Um, so that leaves us in a place trying to actually make sense of the near, the medium and the far future and, and work these things out for ourselves. Um, and recently, we wrote an article uh, sharing a, a kind of basic tool that some futurists use to help us understand and make sense of near-term uncertainty. This is something called um, impact wheels or impact maps. And they're nice because they're very approachable. Um, most people can sit down and work through one in a period of 15 minutes or a half an hour and begin to make some sense of what might happen next as a means of kind of painting a bigger, richer picture of what the next three, six weeks, six months, or a year might look like. What are some of the big changes that happen when something significant shifts? So the way these maps work is you start with a basic simple circle in the middle, uh, and in that circle you record some kind of change, so something major that's shifting. The example that I've been using recently has been a big shift that many of us went through recently, which is having to work from home. And we've seen the disruption and the change that that's created. So if a majority of people are suddenly having to work from home and uh, take care of their families, do their jobs, and all of those things from within the confines of an apartment or a flat or a house with other family members, um, other adults or children involved, there's a lot of things that are changing there suddenly that we have to, to untangle or tease apart to understand how to make sense of them. So, for example, one of the first things that many of us experienced when working from home is uh, a bandwidth squeeze or uh, we didn't have enough computers or webcams in the house. Um, so we have a kind of if if everyone's working from home, a first order impact of that may be that there's a, a technology squeeze. Um, that limits what we can do. We have a finite amount of resources and that we have to figure out how to make it go further. Um, another issue happening away from the technology is family care conflict. Um, we might have to look after children and help them get through uh, distance learning and schooling at the same time as taking care of the work that we do at our jobs on a daily basis. So if we're all working from home, family care conflict is also a, a first order impact that happens. Um, thinking about jobs themselves, another first order impact that's happened has been um, thinking about how do we manage remote work? How do teams collaborate? How do we work with people that we used to maybe sit next to or be in the same office with, uh, but now might be across the city, across the country, or in another country altogether? Um, so we've had to work out new ways of dealing with remote work collaboration at the same time. So there are many more examples of first order impacts that happen when we all suddenly have to work from home. But these are three, there's a technology impact, uh, a social impact, um, and an economic or work impact, just to take those. Now, each of those first order steps also generate second order impacts. Um, so just like the first stage of the exercise where you take one step forward, we choose one of those nodes like the technology squeeze and take another step forward. So if we're all having to, to um, share or fight over the same amount of bandwidth that's available to our city or our neighborhood, um, one of the things that we found happening is um, traffic caps. Uh, either the network providers or the government steps in and basically says, look, everybody has to share a certain amount of bandwidth. So um, everyone will have to, to uh, cap the amount that they use. 
at least in the short term, that's a way of managing capacity and finding a way forward. Um, other changes that happen are um, around uh, um, different forms of technology sharing and uh, how we might have to actually take turns or work in shifts uh, to share the computers that we have if you're um, sharing only one or two in a home. Um, or maybe people have to take different kind of day and night shifts in their work to spread risk around and to make sure there's enough uh, resource for everyone to use. On the family care conflict side, equally there are different second order impacts. So some of those might be um, distance childcare. Uh, we've seen early examples and early signals of this where people may be working from home, uh, one or two adults, the mom and dad in the family or the parents, uh, and they have some other means besides school to look after the small children in the family. Maybe it's a babysitter who's um, watching or reading stories. Um, we've also seen that there are shorter work days. Some companies are cutting back and making sure that the stress levels on the, the workers in the house who are also having to care for others uh, isn't completely unmanageable. So digital child care is a second order impact and maybe shorter work days are a second order impact. And each of those second order impacts, of course, has a third order impact. So if we think about things like digital childcare, if it's happening in a broad enough um, variety, then maybe we're going to have new guidelines that are issued or either a set of rules or suggestions as to how people can make that digital childcare work in a way um, that's best for both the children and the family. So we might see new guidelines. On the technology side, we might see regulators step in or government step in and really intervene uh, in the bandwidth sharing issue and try to find ways to sort that out. Now, we created this kind of sketch model in an article that we shared back at the beginning of March, uh, and it was all basically quick uh, from the hip forecasting that we were doing, simply to be able to think out what some of the next few weeks and months might look like and some of the issues that we may have to actually deal with internally as our own company. And here we are in the beginning of May and some of these early signals have actually transpired as trends that are occurring in different markets or different countries. So this simple sketch map on, on an iPad with uh, one or two of us just throwing out ideas gave us not a perfect map, not the exact forecast or the exact scenario that was going to happen, but it gave us a reasonable way of filling in the blanks and removing some of the uncertainty about the weeks and months ahead. We could have replaced that central change about working from home with any number of issues like um, a vaccine may take a long time or um, governments may keep borders closed for the rest of the year. And we would take the same process of stepping forward and asking if this change happens, what's a first order impact? What's the second order impact of that? Now, Again, this is not the most sophisticated tool in the toolbox, but sometimes just giving us a sense of what may be in the next weeks or months is good enough. In a time like this, when we have a lot of conflicting information, um, a lot of unknown unknowns and, and things that we uh, really don't have a clear picture of yet, we can still use these kind of basic tools with um, one or two people sitting at a table with a blank piece of paper and a coffee cup to trace a circle around and sketch out these simple models and um, help you think out what the situation might be and how you might respond to it in the near future. So whether you're graduating from university and wondering what the job market might be like in the next three or six months, um, if you're trying to run a small business or an institution or just manage a family and manage your own kind of personal issues, being able to, to sit down and ask yourself, what would happen if this change happens? is sometimes the simplest way to take some really small but useful steps forward and minimize the level of uncertainty and also minimize the level of anxiety that you feel about the future. Now, it may be some time before things actually get clearer and a lot of us are working on different sophisticated models and tools to, to really figure out what might um, take place in the near future. But the biggest issue is not to get the prediction right or not to get the forecast exactly right but to use these simple stories of the future as a way of helping us ask ourselves what we have uh, that would help tackle that future or kind of meet that challenge, uh, what we need and how we might actually do things differently if we face that challenge. And by having that level of preparation, 
um, we are, I guess, better equipped to uh, deal with the uncertainty that sits out there ahead of us. So hopefully you'll be able to use this tool uh, and uh, fill in some of those blanks, reduce the amount of uncertainty around you, and maybe feel a little bit more confident about the near future. So hopefully this has been helpful. Thanks. That was Scott Smith on Mapping Impacts and Implications. Scott will also be joined by Ona Haja, Executive Director of ArtScience Museum, in a live moderator conversation on the 12th of May at 5 p.m. So please join us if you're able to on ArtScience Museum's YouTube channel. Our next guest speaker is Cheryl Chong. Cheryl is Co-Director of Executive Education and Head of Strategic Planning at Lee Kuan Yew School of Policy at the National University of Singapore. In her talk, Cheryl will be discussing how we can democratize tools for hope and impart them to youth so that they can design the future. Thank you so much again for joining us at Art Science at Home, our online series of programs. Please stay safe, keep well, and we hope to see you soon.